We're here at the uh, DOS TV, Warriors of the Velvet Rope, with Grandmaster Bahi Muhammad, who uh, happens to be one of my instructors. We're here with uh, Shidoshi Nathan Ingram. I don't think anyone in the world at this point doesn't know who he is. And um, his shining star son, Sensei Jacob Ingram. And we're ready to talk about uh, what goes on as a bouncer, a bodyguard, and sometimes as a hero. Grandmaster Bahi Muhammad, how are you today? I'm good, ma'am. What about yourself? I'm uh, doing well. I, from what I understand, everybody here is ready to rock and roll. Well, I was just, I was just uh, asked yesterday, you know, would I come on? Of course, you know, I would do anything uh, for you guys, man. I mean, you guys have done so much for other people and including me, understand? I mean, if it was 12 o'clock at night or 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, I would have been here. Yeah, so I actually I started in the security uh 1988. <clears throat> and uh of course there's a big difference between a bodyguard and a bouncer. And you know, as a bodyguard, of course, you have to make sure that your 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 client is well protected and respected. And of course, you have to be a very respectful person too, regardless of what other people say or, or even try to do to you, you have to look at your client. As they said, dead clients don't pay. And the other thing is that, you know, if you can, you may cause them to get uh, to get sued. On the other hand, as a bouncer, you know, you have the right to put your hands on people who is out of place. And if you, uh, you know, and most of the time, you know, the cops will, will defend you in that situation because you know nightlife is where people come to relax and uh, some people come just you know for problems and they you know the drinking and you know all these other things that are taking place you know it befalls people's minds and uh, of course you know when I first started my actually first bouncing was <clears throat> at the Golden Bolivian that was with uh, uh, Rami but I bounced around to some other places that I can't even, you know, I can't remember their names now. But one of the last places I ended up bouncing was uh, the Callaloo on Notion Avenue in uh, Eastern Parkway. And that was with uh, Mike Peaks. And uh, if I get anything wrong, uh, Sheehan Glenn, Sir. Uh, please, please uh, direct me uh, back to the right course. Yes, sir. Everybody yeah. ended their career at the Kalaloo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of place it was. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I mean, Dad said he stopped it there. Yeah. It was, yeah actually, everything was going on. Everything was going on there. You had the Bloods, you had the Crips, you had the, uh, you had the Latin Kings, you had the, I don't know, Latin Queens. <laughs> you know, you had everybody. Then you had to really watch your back. And that's why I appreciate almost everybody, not everybody, but you know, most of the brothers who work at the Calalo, we watch these others back and we realize that, look, man, we have to help each other go home to the families. You know, uh, some memorable uh, situations. I think my first tackle <laughs> uh, with someone was a gangster there. And uh, he was well known. I didn't know him because I just come to work there. And we met at the uh, coat check, the, the female's coat check. And he was at the coat check and he thought that, you know, he had um, the green light to do what he wanted to do at, you know, at the coat check. So I told him, my man, look, you got to step off. And he didn't. So, you know, I did what I had to do at that time. You understand? I was pretty proficient, you know, in my chokes. I didn't hit anybody that often unless it was to get into my chokes. And uh, so I him I put him, you know, fastly, I put him in a fast choke, took him to the back door. So when he woke up, he, you know, he went to Mike and said, you know, hey, man, what the hell happened? I mean, I, I, one moment I'm at the cold check, and then I wake up at the back door. How did that happen? You know, you know, he, and he, you know, he had, uh, had a little gang of boys with him, you know, and all of them was like, yeah, did that really happen? And uh, I mean, after that, we, you know, we became friends and everything. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys, I got a harsh voice here. 
But uh, yeah, that was my first situation at the Callaloo, you know, putting this guy to sleep. And like I say, at the back door, a lot of things happened. I put a lot of guys to sleep at the back door. As a matter of fact, putting people to sleep was just my thing. I didn't hit people, uh, except right. for one guy. They right. should have called you the Sandman. <laughs> well, but I, I think it that's what you your did. your name, the Sandman. Right, right. Yeah, I knew a couple of guys that was really efficient. I don't know if you guys remember. Uh, his name was uh, they call him Bogard, and Bogard was a uh, a really tough guy. He trained under under uh, Fred Hamilton. A lot, of, a lot of people knew who Fred Hamilton oh, was. Oh, oh, no doubt about it. Yeah. Martial arts. Bogard no was one of his top black belts. He trained with the Garrison twins and he was, I, very few people, I had the, the, uh, uh, the pleasure of watching do martial arts in a, a bouncing situation as good as Bogart. And when I'm saying do martial arts, because people don't realize that in, in bouncing, it's different from doing martial arts like you're in the dojo. A lot of people think there's a lot of kicking in it. There is some, but most of the time we use a lot of restraining techniques. Restraining whether techniques, yes. Yeah, whether it's getting you in a bear hug, whether it's, you know, getting you in a lock, whether it's getting you in a, a chokehold without yep. hurting you, because I don't think too many people ever died on, at the hands of a bouncer in a chokehold. I could be wrong. Um, not yeah. in my time, and I've been body, uh, doing bodyguard and bouncing since 1979. But okay. with that being with that being said, um, my I want to correct my son on something. I never worked at the that club. Uh, what's the name of the club? Uh, you just said Callaloo. Uh, Callaloo. I never worked there. I did go to visit, um, and um, I heard a lot about it. The last club I ever worked was at BB King, but by he, okay. my brother, Grandmaster. What I want to the question I want to ask you: Can okay. you share with us? What do you think was the most life-changing experience for you um, as being a bouncer or a bodyguard, either or something that happened that might have just changed uh, 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 your whole mindset about the job? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, certain situations, uh, took place as a, as a bodyguard, of course, it was, uh, it was an easy thing for me. It wasn't really that tough. I just may have to make sure that I kept my clients uh, safe. As a bouncer to realize in this, and this is what changed my pers perspective on certain techniques and so forth. As a bouncer, I realized that, you know, I had certain techniques that I had to throw away and I had certain techniques that I had to do more of. And I had, and this is where I found out that when you master something, you know, you can call upon it. But if you're one of those guys, you understand, who just go through a few techniques and leave them, <clears throat> then you're going to get yourself hurt because you think you can count upon something that's really not there. So I took my chokes and I really, really, and this is the time that the Gracie was coming to New York, especially Henso Gracie. And of course, a lot of people don't know that I, you know, uh, I train with these guys, but my, my, my chokes is something that I took to the next level. I basically had two chokes. I mean, I used four, but there was two chokes that I used. When, and then when it come down to it, I had one because and that is the one where, you know, the naked choke, the naked choke was no doubt the, uh, my favorite. There's two naked choke, but the one where you interlock your hands, your palms together. And that's because, you know, if you get stuck in the other choke and this guy has, uh, he's, he's, he's got friends, he's got brothers, you may get stuck in that, you know, and, and not be able to pull your hands out, you know, your arms out quickly. So I developed, the, the palm to palm choke into my head against this person's head so that I can see what's around me. Because if you get focus in your in your choke and not be able to see what's around you, brother, you you, you got problems. So absolutely. I would say absolutely. I gotta yeah. agree with that. Yeah. So that was my that was the changing part 
You understand? Uh, knowing that, look, okay, I've been training since 1967, but I know that there's certain things you can't do here because you got, uh, this guy may have quite a few people with him. And most of the time they do. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with multiple attackers. And that's the other thing is that, you know, as a bouncer, you got to learn how to deal with multiple attackers. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. And I want to touch on that, too. I'm glad you, okay. you brought that up because, you know, listening to our podcast, I know a lot of people probably have a problem with, you know, some of the, 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 the guests on the show talking about, you know, they fought more than one guy. They fought three and four guys. And people don't realize it's really true because a lot of times yeah. you have guys that come to the club in groups. Yeah, most and of them they do. They come in with three, four, five guys um, because it may be a slow night and the owner might say, let them in, man, we need to make the money. But right. not knowing that once these, not realizing once these guys get drunk, we're not dealing with one guy. We know that they're going to all have each other's yep. back. And there's yep. so many good. situations where bouncers like us, we have gotten jumped and we had to handle our business. And then you didn't have a person that's never bounced or they bounced in another country where you can't, I yeah. was telling my son earlier, you can't compare us doing bouncing jobs in Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Southern no. Avenue and all these places yep. compared to a place in Europe. No, <laughs> you not even understand? Something. You like, can't, there's two totally different things, man. That's like putting you in a lion's den with a pork chop suit in one place and then yep. putting you in another lion's den with a, with a lion's costume on so you can fit in. So yeah. uh, 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 when people say that, I have to say to our audience, man, that these a lot of these stories can be confirmed. And when you try to compare us to bounces from other states or other uh, countries that can uh, they guarantee to go home the next morning after their job is over. A lot of times, a lot of us didn't make it home because of the horrible clubs we worked in and the horrible environment. That, that's right. I, I just had to bring that up to come to the defense of some of my brothers that's uh, in this business to let people know, man, you're listening to the podcast, but you're listening to real stories. No matter what you yeah. think or, or, or what you might say, these are true stories of true heroes, man, that protected many people's lives. I had yeah, to go see, there. I'm sorry. Yeah. 